you very much. Um, I would now like to introduce uh, Professor Sir Terence Stevenson, uh, who's a who's a Nuffield Professor of Child Health at Great Ormond Street, and is the co-director of the nationally funded uh, Children's Policy Research Unit. Um, he was knighted in 2018 for services to healthcare and, and children's health services, and is currently the chair of the Health Research Authority for England. And, and I'm really grateful that he uh, can talk to us today about the CLOCK study. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Amar. I'll just uh, screen share if I can. There we go. OK. How's that looking? Perfect. Thank you so much. Wonderful. OK, well, it's been an amazing afternoon listening to the other research, most of which I, I, I hear about on a regular basis. It's ex exciting. It's amazing to think it's it's almost exactly a year since we were awarded funding for this study. And it's been, I think, the busiest year of my professional life, doing research on a new condition at pace, at scale, at speed, uh, always against the backdrop of it's going to get better, vaccination's coming, it's dying out, you've got to recruit people really quickly. So it's been a, an amazing uh, experience as, as a clinician and a researcher. I'm going to tell you briefly about the CLOCK study on behalf of a large consortium. I won't name everybody, but they're from all over England and one of our collaborators from Edinburgh. So why did we do this? Well, all of you will know that fortunately uh, SARS-CoV-2 has been a, a fairly mild acute illness for children and young people. Tragically, there have been deaths, but the most of the children admitted to paediatric intensive care had pre-existing medical problems and the numbers really are tiny compared to the perhaps 150,000 adult deaths across the United Kingdom. But in contrast to morbidity and mortality, uh, infection rates among young people uh, have been very high, not least because they have not been uh, vaccinated until very recently. And so we knew that between September 2020 and March 2021, there were a quarter of a million young people who tested positive uh, for SARS-CoV-2 and another one and a quarter million who tested negative. We know that because Public Health England has a database of everybody in England who's ever had a PCR test, positive or negative, and it holds their name, their postal address, their sex and date of birth. So we applied for funding to do what's called a matched cohort study. And I will come back to this theme probably repeatedly. I've just been reviewing a, a study for uh, uh, today where there is no control group. And I think that's a problem with much of what's been published worldwide. We felt we would follow 15,000 teenagers who tested positive and compare them to a matched group of 15,000 young people who tested negative to try and tease out what can be attributed to the virus and what is due to living through this very unusual pandemic that we've all experienced, uh, social disruption, failure to attend school, disruption of uh, exams, disruption of, of friendship groups and, and bereavement, seeing grandparents and parents die. We also specifically decided not to ask about did you have long COVID because there was at this time no accepted definition. We just asked young people about their symptoms and we're following them over a two year period. And in the interest of time, there's no not enough time to show you everything we've done. I'm just going to show you a couple of data slides and then point you to where you can read more. Our first publication is based on, we've now got 30,000 young people in the study, but the first paper is based on 6,800 who were able to tell us about their symptoms three months after their PCR test. And that 6,800 represents a 13% response rate, which is comparable to many of the other studies that have been published worldwide. And it shows the difficulty of doing research on long COVID and why you need a control group, because Although two thirds of our test positives had symptoms three months later, over half of the negatives also had at least one symptom. And it was only when we started to look at three or more symptoms or five or more symptoms, we started to get better discrimination. And for those multiple symptoms, the chances of having multiple symptoms three months after a positive test was twice as great as three months after a negative test. So 30% versus 16% for three plus symptoms and 13% versus 6% for five plus symptoms. And what kind of symptoms were they? Again, there was a lot of overlap, which shows why you need a control group. Uh, the light colored bars are the test positives. The dark colored bars are the test negatives. Uh, tiredness, shortness of breath, headache, 
the two big discriminators were loss of smell or taste, a symptom that is really peculiar to SARS-CoV-2 that we don't see with other upper respiratory tract viruses, presumably related to the uh, ACE receptor in the nose and back of the pharynx that the, the virus uses to access the body. And dizziness, which is a symptom we see in teenagers more generally, but it seemed to be particularly common in test positive uh, young people three months after the test. And you have to put these data in the context of pre-pandemic norms. Whilst teenage life is, is by and large a very time of great health, low mortality, uh, teenagers do report a lot of symptoms. And here's two studies from before the pandemic. Over a four to six month period in 2007, a third of all teenagers reported fatigue. And in a 2004 study on any one day, about one in five teenagers would report either headache, fatigue or asthma. So these apparently high rates in the control population, the, the test negatives aren't really that high when you compare them to pre-pandemic normative data. How to interpret these data? Well, we've done what's called a sensitivity analysis. If we consider that our 13% of respondents are entirely representative of the whole population of uh, English teenagers, then across England, there would be about 70,000 young people over that period, September 2020 to March 2021, who had tested positive and would still have three plus symptoms three months later, and 30,000 would have five plus symptoms three months later. But because we've got the test negative control group, we can then ask that question, how much of that is attributable to having had the SARS-CoV-2 virus? We can subtract the background rate in the test negatives from the rate in the test positives. And if we do that, we'd say that the excess is about 33,000 young people over that seven month period would have three plus symptoms or about one in seven or 14% of the quarter of a million who tested positive. And if you want it to be five plus physical symptoms, it would be around 16,000 or 114 or 7%. And that figure of 32,000 is amazingly similar to the well, estimates of by the, at the time we did this uh, sensitivity analysis, the Office of National Statistics in June 2021 were reporting a similar es estimate of prevalence of 31,000. On the other hand, if our 13% of responders are completely unrepresentative, worst case scenario, and the 87% of teenagers who didn't respond to our survey didn't respond because they completely recovered, then of course the numbers are much lower. And we would attribute uh, about, uh, in the final paragraph, to the virus, we'd say about 4,000 teenagers over that seven month period of tested positive would have three plus symptoms attributable to the virus and about 2,000 would have five plus symptoms. So it drops to one in 50 or one in 100. So we haven't got a precise answer to how many young people have persisting symptoms, but we have been able to narrow. When we embarked on our study, the publication suggested anything from 1% to 51%. And I think what we're saying is something much more like something between probably 2% and 14%. For mental health, I've been talking about physical symptoms, very reassuringly using standardized instruments. There were no differences in the mental health outcomes uh, between uh, young people who tested positive and tested negative three months after the test, and their scores were a little different from normative data pre-pandemic. So this study is important. It's the largest match study of children and young people we know of in the world, and we're just embarking on recruiting another cohort of what we call an Omicron cohort from January 2022 to see if that variant uh, changes the risk of having persisting symptoms. All of the positives are PCR lab proven, they're not self-reported. They are self-reported symptoms, not some arbitrary definition of long COVID. We have a negative control group and it's not a single center. Many of the studies from around the world are single center follow-up studies and this is a national uh, representative study. The publications to date, the, the, the information uh, on the protocol is, was published in BMJ Open. We're, our systematic review was published in the Journal of Infection. The uh, data I've just been sharing with you was published in the Lancet uh, Child and Adolescent Health on 8th of February. And the Delphi definition uh, that I'm going to talk to you about uh, in a second uh, is now in uh, open access from 8th of February in Archives of Disease in Childhood. And that was a separate follow-up study where we took our data and all the published literature from the systematic review 
and we did an online Delphi consensus process with 100 people, a mixture of experts, clinicians, researchers, carers and young people, and tried to come up with the definition of long COVID. And this is what we've published, a condition in which a child or young person has symptoms, at least one of which must be physical, that have developed after a diagnosis of COVID-19, confirmed with the test, I'll come back to that, it impacts on their physical, mental or social well-being, interferes with some aspect of daily living and has persisted for three months. And we've also tried to align that with the WHO, who produced a definition of post-COVID-19 condition or long COVID in adults. And in the green box would be our attempt to align our consensus Delphi definition with the WHO wording for young people. To be clear here, this is not a definition to be used for clinical purposes. This was a research definition to allow the comparison of studies in different countries. It would be entirely inappropriate to use this as a referral for young people because um, at the beginning of the pandemic, testing wasn't widely available, but we do for research purposes need to have a positive test because we need to know that we're actually studying young people who've had SARS-CoV-2 virus. And we firmly believe that any decision to refer a young person or treat them or manage them should be a shared decision between a young person, their carer and their clinician and not based on a, a, on a research definition. We've got a lot of future, as all the studies that present this afternoon, we've got plans to do a lot more analysis and studies, including predictors, which was mentioned in the last talk, uh, impact on school attendance, looking at the impact of vaccines and long COVID, and I've mentioned the Omicron cohort. We also have potential collaborations, particularly with the, the convalescent study you just heard about, about deep phenotyping. We've met with Nish Chaturvedi and her colleagues. We think some of that could be extended into people under 18, but we also have potential collaborations with other NIHR funded studies, with a network running out of the Netherlands, with the National Institute of Health in the United States, who's putting a lot of funding into long COVID research and a group in Germany who've done a very large study using routine administrative data. And I'm going to stop there in the interest of time uh, and uh, stop sharing and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much uh, for that really great talk. Um, one of the questions that uh, came came about was whether clock took account of false negatives um, uh, compared to false, more abundant than false positives. Essentially, no. Uh, it's an uh, absolutely fair question and was asked by referees and, and reviewers since. We've assumed that a PCR test is the gold standard. It's the best test we've got. But we fully recognise that PCR tests can be false negative and occasionally false positive. What we can be clear about, just in case there's any ambiguity, is we can distinguish young people who originally tested negative and became positive. We have a longitudinal track on them. So the, the negatives I'm describing are, if you will, pure negatives throughout. Again, we can't exclude the fact that they may have had an infection before we got up to testing. But again, that, that bedevils all studies of, of COVID. Thank you. Thanks for that um, fascinating talk, for Stevenson. There's been a lot of questions around um, symptomatology and how it was measured and whether it was binary outcomes, questionnaires, uh, severity scales. Yeah, so very good question also. Uh, I did say this was done at Pearson scale. If we could run the whole thing again with the benefit of hindsight, we would have asked more about definitely about severity. We Our initial, when you have a bunch of collaborators, you can imagine the initial questionnaire was about 22 pages and took three hours to complete. And we were quite clear that teenagers were not going to do this. Our goal was to get it down in a pilot study to about 20 minutes. But we regret, and in our in our 12 month follow up, we're going to ask more about severity. So this was binary. Did you have this symptom or not? You're quite right. And uh, that is partly why we've drawn on multiple symptoms because we couldn't couldn't quantify how severe the symptoms were, but it's also why we're very keen that our research definition isn't used for referral purposes. As many people have pointed out, one completely debilitating symptom, if you're so fatigued you can't get out of bed, that can trump five mild symptoms. And we, we completely acknowledge that, completely acknowledge that. But, but it's important, as you say, to rapidly start research and start collecting this data so that we do have an understanding of what the effect of COVID is in children. So, so thank you very much for that talk. Thank you.